really what Web3 is about is it, it's about a, providing tools to people so that they don't need to go through these um, uh, intermediaries of massive, un unprecedented power um, in order to do their day-to-day -day things that they want to do, whether it's, you know, buy their groceries and get it delivered to their door, or whether it's just to share some photos with a friend. So in this mini series of Web3, I'll talk to some of the key players and the coders and the activists that are working in the space and that are creating this infrastructure. Because Web3, for the first time, uh, provides the possibility and the opportunity for us to have a human-based infrastructure. Because of its decentralized nature, we will automatically become co-creators of the technological infrastructure that we will then live with or under, depending on how. And this is very interesting stuff, but it needs to be done consciously. Um, so by talking to some of these key players, I get to see how they think and how they refer to this responsibility. Um, and the first person I talked to was Dr. Gavin Wood, who is a big player in the space. Uh, he co-founded Ethereum in 2014 and then uh, coined the term Web 3.0 also in 2014. He also founded the Web3 Foundation and Polkadot, which is an interoperability blockchain, as well as Kusama, which is the canary network of Polkadot, where they do all the experimentation. Uh, he also founded Substrate and Parity Technologies. So a big player, and he does, uh, he very much knows what he's talking about. He's referring to our current days as the old days, which I think is an indicator of how, how savvy he is in this space. Uh, so we, here we talk about the, like why Web3 is and what it is, and to provide this first framework for the continuing conversation. Uh, I hope you enjoy the talk. Hi, nice to be here. Thanks for coming. So we, let's just jump straight uh, in. Um... Good. So you actually coined the term uh, Web3 already in 2014, which is now seven years ago, so quite a while ago, and have been working in the space ever since. You founded the Web3 Foundation and Parity Technologies, as well as Polkadot and Kusama, and also co-starred Ethereum. So there's a lot of Web3 background with, with who you are and what you know. So it's, I feel like you are the right person to ask when it comes to what it is. <laughs> so, but before this, as far as I understand it, the whole basis of Web3 is, like the whole concept of Web3 is that the current system, the Web2 system is not working. Um, so before we talk about it, can you explain to us why, why it is not working? Or what ar areas of it is not working? Sure. So um, <clears throat> uh, Web2 was very much um, based around our existing social structures. And indeed, it's based around the uh, social paradigms and the general mentality that we have of building and interoperating and communicating um, as, as humans. So, you know, if we take things back 500 years, 1000 years, more, uh, people were, were pretty um, bound to their, their townships or their villages. Mm. And this, this had, uh, you know, very important ramifications. It meant that leaving a township or a village was a, a very high cost. Um, and therefore, what this meant, because there were relatively few people in a village, what it meant was that your reputation was incredibly important. Um, and it was recorded by each and every member of the village. Everyone would basically have a, have a mental table about um, everybody else in the village and, and, and whether they were of, of good repute, whether they had maybe done something bad in the past, maybe they'd wronged them, maybe they owed them money um, and whatever else. Now, as, as we moved into a more, you know, uh, initially, initially, you know, more, more connected, connected nations, nations. A, a more connected worlds, more connected nations, we, we, you know, the concept of a city came up where people really couldn't know everybody else in the same city. And obviously, as we as we globalized even beyond that, um, 
these kinds of uh, sort of initial village like systems where people sort of um, in, connect as peers with other people and they sort of maintain a reputation um, uh, sort of table in their head uh, they don't work anymore because there's way too many people and so we've fallen back on other things we've fallen back on um, on, on effectively brands right this is what it comes down to logos symbolism um, so we have uh, things like, um, you know, we have institutions, right? We have banks, um, even elements of government. Um, and these do not constitute an individual that is likely to do something, you know, is likely to act in much the same way from day to day, but they constitute groups of individuals, organizations. Um, and our assumption is that if an organization was trustworthy at one point in the past, it will be continue to be trustworthy at, um, into the future. Um, now, this, this isn't a great um, way of dealing with the world, it turns out. And this is especially the case when institutions get larger and therefore the, um, uh, the effects of the, uh, the external world, um, the, the, the ramifications of macroeconomic factors become um, ever, uh, ever more um, significant. Um, and we see this with... Um, with a lot in a lot of ways, uh, you know, in many respects, this kind of um, this way of thinking about who to do to do business with, who to transact with, who to who who we are going to as humans when we're wandering around in our daily lives, um, who to actually um, uh, uh, interact with, um, it becomes a lot harder. Uh, it becomes a lot more what I, what I would call trust bound. Basically, we have to blindly trust in these institutions, in these organizations. Um, we have to trust that uh, basically because lots of other people are using them, that, that it, it, it's reasonable for us to use them. Um, we also have to trust that because they haven't done anything bad in the past that we, we know, know about, <laughs> that they will continue not to wrong us going into the future. Now these are um, these are not great ways of of of, um, of operating in the world, right? Um, unfortunately, it's all we have with the um, with the social systems that we've set up with civilization as we knew it, leading into the year two thousand. Now the internet came along in the in the nineties and it made these problems with the world. I mean, th these are pretty fundamental problems. Um, and we see we see them actually um, acting out in things like, for example, the 2008 financial crisis. But these are um, really uh, um, dramatically magnified when you add something like the internet into the mix, which moves things from of the order of a city or a nation to global, right? Suddenly, we're not dealing with a, a million or two million people. We're, we're dealing, dealing with seven billion people and we're having to trust things like brands in order to decide who we're going to deal with um what the branding um element does what this sort of um th this this sort of um trusting of symbolism does is it results in relatively few relatively large organizations um uh, uh, basically taking the the lion's share of um, of the world's interaction, the world's economic um, and communicative um, interaction, and um, what this really, if we if we're sort of getting down to, to brass tacks, what this actually means is, um, we have uh, you know massive um, super lords of the internet forming, like Amazon, like Google, like Twitter, like Facebook, um, and these are really the the, um, the, the gatekeepers, gatekeepers of the internet. internet. They have their own platforms, and they build moats around their platforms, and they build walls around the gardens and basically what it is is like you you, you, you can, can come, come play in our playground with with everyone else but um uh, but but you play by our rules and if we decide we want to change the rules then uh you basically don't have any, any choice, choice if you, you want, want to interact with all of the people that you've been interacting with so far these platforms are incredibly sticky right it's very difficult to get people to change because of the network effects as a platform gets bigger its value proposition to people that have yet to join and indeed people that have already joined um, exponentially or at least superlinearly increases now um, this is basically the problem 
with Web2, right? It's it's heavily trust bound and it's trust bound beyond the the the, the previous era of, of trust boundness, this sort of city and nation states with their logos and their symbolism and their institutions that people pretty much have to buy into. Um, it's moved beyond that into this globalized um, symbolism, this globalized symbolic um, uh, uh, digital society um, where, you know, to, to even to, to send a message to your friend just down the road, many people will use Facebook, will go via this completely opaque um, foreign entity to, to, um, uh, to, to relay, relay their, their communications with their friend, friend just down the road. road. Like, like this, this would have been unthinkable um, 30 or 40 years ago, but today it, it, it's just the norm. And so this is, uh, and this, this is the issue, right? We, we, in order to do these day-to-day -day things like say, Hey mate, I'm going to meet you for a, a beer at seven 30. Okay. Um, we, we have to trust a huge, huge multinational corporation with completely opaque um, internal uh, operations and with a arbitrary rule set that's continually changing. Uh, that is a very proper and quite a deep problem explanation of our current uh, world. But I mean, for sure, a lot of our current infrastructure that is is very obviously not uh, working and we see this everywhere like it's crackling up it's the whole discussion of surveillance capitalism parallel to privacy and all of this so like it is in flames but what you were talking about in the beginning is a quite deep shift no so if it's all like do we wait for it to burn down first or do we build it new already? Like, what? Where does Web three come into this? Is this like is Web three the little fire that's gonna burn the whole city down, or what? Or is it the new building? Well, I, I think Web two is already beginning to burn down, and it's not just Web two, uh, but it's the social, the, the 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 broad society, the broad civilization these social paradigms that Web2 um, uh, uh, grew from, right? This very trust-bound infrastructure that we've created. Um, Web2 is exacerbating these problems, but the problems existed beforehand. Um, society is trust-bound. Um, it has been for a long time, but as it's, become, as it's becoming better connected, it's becoming um, the problems and the flaws with it are becoming um, greater in magnitude and more exposed to potential attacks. So it's this isn't really um, an option. We don't have the option of sitting around waiting for Web2 and the social paradigm, the civilization, trust-bound society in general um, uh, to burn around us. We need to find alternative approaches to mass scale human interaction. And that's really where Web3 comes in. And how does Web3 do this? Like what is Web3, what technology is? The, I mean, the base of Web3 is the blockchain technology, no? And that is a completely new architecture. But how how does this actually work? I mean, this is a big, big promise that you are giving. It's a little bit like solving the, the climate crisis on a plate, you know? It's It has this element of, uh, of glory to it. Sure, yeah, I mean, Web3 is not the answer for everything. And um, I think it would be uh, disingenuous to try to, to, to suggest that it is. But it is trying to, um, really what Web3 is about is it, it's about a, providing tools to people so that they don't need to go through these um, uh, intermediaries of massive, un unprecedented power um, in order to do their day-to-day -day things that they want to do, whether it's, you know, buy their groceries and get it delivered to their door, or whether it's just to share some photos with a friend, um, or whether it's to auction off some old furniture that they don't need anymore. Like, this is, um, 
these are things that we have come to expect from the digital world. And at the moment, the way that we, uh, that we can do them is we go through a massively centralized multinational service provider in order to do it. And we basically trust them with, with everything. We trust them with all of the knowledge and we trust that they won't misuse this knowledge. Um, uh, we trust them with all, all the various information about ourselves, about how we live our lives, what we want to, what, we, what our desires are in the case of search engines and, 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 uh, um, and you know, large e-commerce sites. Um, and what it is that we're talking about in the case of, um, uh, you know, message, messengers, uh, communication platforms. And uh, uh, oftentimes, you know, with payment platforms, for example, with our finances, with our, with our uh, hard-earned cash. Um, and this is, um, yeah, th this, this really isn't so good. And this is what Web3 aims to provide an alternative tool set for, a set of uh, technologies, a set of protocols, formats, um, uh, in order to allow these massively multi-user global applications to be built, these services to exist, but without any single all-powerful service provider that has access to all of this data and can use it for its own, um, uh, for its own good. And um, it, it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting question how this works. Um, and it's something that, you know, many people have been spending a lot of, many very clever people have been spending a lot of, a lot of time uh, trying to, um, uh, 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 trying to sort of innovate and, and, and create these kinds of alternatives. But yeah, roughly speaking, um, a, a big chunk of Web3 is blockchain technology, um, which forms a big pillar of this concept of the trustless, uh, trustless technology, which um, if you want a very quick definition is, is basically like um, how if I don't know, if I, if I didn't, didn't know you, uh, but I, I wanted to do, the, to do some sort of deal with you, um, how could we arrange to do that deal, just the two of us, um, without bringing in a third party that we both trust, right? So just the, just the two of us, um, how do we do that deal without trusting each other without trusting that the other one is is definitely going to pay us or without trusting that the other one is definitely going to give us the service or the goods how do we do that deal um and up until now in society or more or less now in society and civilization we have had to either um grow up with that person so i would have to have shared a village or a town with you and have known you um or we would have had to appeal to um, a third party either a friend that we both trust or, as in more recent years, um, some sort of social institution, be it the government, a bank, an insurance broker, a trading firm, um, a, a, some sort of uh, third party um, uh, wholesaler, whatever it is, we would have to have gone through this, this, this third party, this trustworthy third party, this middleman. And this, these middlemen, these intermediaries, they generally charge quite a lot of money for the service of trust and that's not so great um so it's also prone trust in general is prone to um, um uh, 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 sort of con man tricksters um whether it's on a small scale or whether it's like in 2008 on a much larger scale um <clears throat> and so really when we say trustless or trust free what we mean is <clears throat> where we don't need to go through these these intermediaries, these middlemen, or indeed have to just blindly trust the other person, where you have a very good reason to believe that the deal will go through as we expect. Um, and yeah, blockchain really does provide this, but there are other ways of, um, of let's say, reducing or, or entirely um, um, removing trust. Um, for example, technologically. Um, uh, sorry, could you repeat? Also technologically. Indeed, also technologically. Um, one of them is uh, would be to use encryption. So if I encrypt my message before I send it to you, um, then even if it happens to go through Google or Facebook and their various servers, um, then I still have a really good level of, of, um, of, of credible expectation that they won't be able to read the message. It'll just be me and you who can see what it is that I've written. Um, similarly, if I use digital signing technology, so again, cryptography, um, 
in order to sign the message with a key of mine, with a private key, uh, basically, so that you know uh, when you see this digital signature that someone who had access to my private key must have created it. Um, either that or certain mathematical assumptions are broken. But we, we, there's a very small chance that the mathematical assumptions are broken. And there's, if we assume there's a small chance that someone has stolen my private key, then we can assume that there's a very, very large chance, a credible expectation that it was indeed me who sent the message. And this is really crucial um, because if you receive, if Facebook servers go wrong, and you're trusting Facebook to deliver messages from me to you, um, and you're trusting Facebook to say, hey, it was actually me who sent the message, then it means the system is open to abuse, either by an employee at Facebook or potentially by some nefarious um, third party that is hacked into Facebook systems, systems. and is using them to, um, uh, uh, to send you a message, um, a apparently from me, but actually not really. I mean, there's also an obvious vulnerability with having so much centralized power, as we saw just a month ago, or whenever it was when Facebook was down for a couple of hours, and all of Latin America was relying on WhatsApp just went black, for example, like these, these things are a big, it's another infrastructural problem. And Web3 Indeed. would prevent this by basically having decentralized like decentralized technology so that everybody runs their own version of mini Facebook on their little computers and that would create, or how does it, how does it work? Yeah, that's right. So um, decentralization reduces points of failure. Um, I mean, it, very literally, it, it, if, there, if it is decentralized in terms of, um, in terms of the underlying authors, the underlying um, creators, and also separately in terms of operations, whoever is actually running it day to day. If it's decentralized in that fashion, then it basically reduces the chance of a systemic failure, it reduces the chance of a flaw that will take down the entire system. Now, when you've got a single company that creates something, um, such as Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever, um, then it means that realistically, there's likely to be a single team that is responsible for its creation. Um, oftentimes, there can be one or ver very few, potentially only one individual that's responsible for a very large amount of the code. This is um, uh, this is not this effectively increases, like dramatically increases the chance because humans are human, right? They make mistakes. It in massively increases the chance that. Um, a single mistake by a single person can be uh, a, ultimately take down an entire global infrastructure. On the other hand, um, we have operations. If a single company is, is behind the operations of some particular service, as is the case with Google, with Facebook, with WhatsApp, right, with Twitter, with Amazon, um, then Again, a mistake by a single person who is presumably you know, contracted to keep the servers up or a mistake in the, the various processes that the company uses to ensure that things are rolled out correctly, that things are upgraded correctly. Um, a mistake here can again completely um, take down the entire global infrastructure. So it's it's problematic. And the reason that the internet and the reason that email have managed to stick around for so long without any major outage is because it's not actually centralized. There isn't a company called the Internet Corp that runs the internet, right? In the same way that Facebook runs Facebook and Google runs Google. Um, the internet would keep going if Facebook went down or if Google went down. Yeah, sure, people wouldn't be able to search for things as easily, uh, but it wouldn't be long before they figured out that there's a search engine called DuckDuckGo or a search engine called Bing or a search engine that Yahoo still works or AltaVista still works, right? There will be, um, there are alternatives. Um, and the internet itself is, is really just a big network of independent individual nodes. If one node or even a large cluster of nodes goes down, it kind of self heals. It sort of roots things around uh, so you're uh, the nodes that are still up. Sorry, but you're recreating the internet then to some extent. Like it is going um, back to the vision that existed in the early 90s when it was new and it was deeply decentralized before it got monopolized and got into these big companies. Like it's a very similar ideological ground. 
Yes, in part. So the internet was had two uh, these two elements of decentralization. Right? It had the decentralization of its creation in that many different um, computers, many different operating systems, many different pieces of software each re-implemented elements of the internet software. Right. TCP IP, these internet pro HTTP, these protocols that we have that sit behind and make the internet work. Then there's not just one company that makes these protocols. There are many of them. Um, and they and, and if one of them has a flaw in it, it, it's not such a big deal because many others will continue working. And it's the same with the other side of decentralization as well operation, right? Many different companies are involved. I mean, thousands are involved in running nodes on the internet, making the internet work day to day. Now, with Web3 protocols, we do indeed take on this, these elements of decentralization. Um, for example, with both Polkadot with, uh, and Ethereum, um, when it's uh, the two protocols that I've been um, heavily involved with, um, the uh, there are there are multiple teams that implement the core protocol that ensure that the core protocol um, is uh, 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 can be run right. Um, second, se separately, there are multiple companies and individuals and teams that run the nodes day to day, that run the software day to day to make it to keep the network going. Right. In the case of Polkadot, there's like. Uh, between Polkadot and the Kusama, the other main uh, main um, uh, network of, uh, in the Polkadot family, um, there are there are I know, thirteen, four, I think maybe two thousand above two thousand um, nodes. So above two thousand sort of computers that together run and operate these um, uh, these services. Um, with Ethereum, I don't know how many it is, but I, I think it, it's certainly in the um, dozens, if not hundreds, um, that are um, actively um, uh, uh, running, uh, which by which I mean um, retaining the network and moving it along, advancing it, processing transactions. And so um, this means that if any one of these um, pieces of software or, um, or, or nodes or, or machines um, stops running for some reason, um, then the network itself will keep going. So it basically just makes it a lot more resilient and to some degree unstoppable, like it is internet, but impossible to shut down. That's indeed our goal. It's to create these kind of unstoppable protocols. Now, this isn't, Web3 is not a trademarked thing. People can bandy it about as much as they want. And so um, it's important to understand what the meaning behind Web3 is, right? The meaning behind Web3, and you pretty much nailed it, right? It's unstoppable protocols that give very clear, very credible guarantees about what we can expect the protocol to do, right? What we can expect the service to be. Um, if I send some Bitcoin to another address, then I have a very credible guarantee, guarantee. That it will be reduced, that val that balance will be reduced from the accounts that I control and will be increased, or the same amount of balance will increase in the address that I want to send it to. Basically, I'm pretty solidly guaranteed that I will get that transfer, that transfer will happen. Um, the same is not true with PayPal, right? Oftentimes you can send money also with banks, also with Visa. Oftentimes you can send money through the banking system of which Pay PayPal is very much a member now. And uh, and it won't arrive where you expect. The same is not true with the, uh, you know, if you send a, an internet message to somebody, like an email or, or, or a lower level message, like a UDP message or a TCP IP message, it will arrive. It will arrive realistically um, in China. Um, it will arrive in Iran. It, it, you know, it, the internet doesn't care, right? The internet is a service for everybody. And the same is true with um, a protocol like Bitcoin. It's it's a service for everybody. It doesn't try to distinguish between who's friendly with whom, right? It's just, it's an unstoppable protocol and it gives solid guarantees. And this is at the basis, this is at the, the crux of Web3. And if the protocol is not unstoppable, right? If it's not designed to be unstoppable, if it's actually run by a relatively small number of well-aligned people, or it sits in the same data center, or it needs the same one single developer team, um, then it's not really decentralized, not really unstoppable. Um, and 
it therefore, in my mind, as the person that coined Web3 back in April 2014, is not a Web3 protocol. Okay, I see. So mainly one thing that I'm thinking of, I mean, many, many things, but mainly one, because when you're writing code, you are writing the rules down no like it's the whole premise of code is law and in in every sense of the every sense of the meaning and this makes it a very very important task especially because this is infrastructure what you what you're building here is this human key infrastructure like without a doubt like as web 2 right now is human key infrastructure like you text your neighbor if you want to go and have a beer with him that's like even if it's on a low social level it's still human key infrastructure and this is a big i mean whether you whether technologists you included uh, like it or not this is a big political responsibility because it comes with these implications of that what you are writing down as the infrastructure will be the roads that the future, hum the future of humanity will walk on for a long time to come. Like our cities now are built around rivers. You know, it, def it defines our whole our whole life. So, and if this is not like if these themes are not consciously processed or consciously worked with within the coding communities, it's I mean. If it's not conscious, it's unconscious. This is the rule, no? So like, how is the how is Web3 then conscious in this regard of being mindful of how you're building the infrastructure so it's less corruptible or less like, bendable to the people that are coding its will? So this is really about um, having credible expectations. Um, the we have to think about how one's expectations can be thwarted by the tools that one uses by the services that one uses um and we web3 in principle the sort of target with web3 is to give absolutely solid guarantees over what it is that you expect to be doing if you expect to be having a private communication with your friend down the road then web3 web3 protocols should be able to give you a solid an expectation of that as solid a guarantee of that um, as uh, as technology as, as human understanding at the time allows for and it will never be perfect nothing is ever perfect but it can be um it, it can be pretty good, right? It can be a lot, lot better than the services that we use at the moment, which um, which revolve around complete and utter trust, blind faith that Facebook isn't scanning all of your messages, right? That there isn't an employee at Facebook that uh, just wants to uh, f just um, uh, mess with you. Um, that there um, uh, that there isn't a, a third party that has managed to hack into Facebook systems that wants to scam you, or that just wants to uh, pull all the traffic of the internet um, in order to do various analysis. Um, we found with the Snowden revelations, for example, that unbeknownst to anybody, um, government syst government uh, systems were. Um, uh, pulling in all of the various video links, not dissimilar to this one, because um, most of them were went around uh, unencrypted. Most of them were just um, uh, sent in, in the clear. Um, they were pulling in all these uh, 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 video links and scanning the images. And uh, many government employees were watching uh, basically um, people's uh, very private um, uh, 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 vid sexting. I don't know what you call it, like... Um, um, uh, sex, uh, sex uh, videos, um, <laughs> long distance, uh, long distance couples trying to uh, spice their relationship. relationship a little, and and it's um, this might you know, have cool. Yeah, all right, continue. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like uh, it, it, the, in, these individuals, these these these, these, these. Uh, people had um, an expectation that you know their link was private. And it was broken, and it was broken in this case by some fairly nefarious government-backed activity. Um, but regardless of 
whether the law of that government supported that activity or not doesn't really matter. The expectations were between those individuals. Um, and the technology did not allow those expectations to be credibly um, uh, guaranteed. And so really it's about us as technologists creating technology which does provide people with the uh, uh, with clear expectations and guarantees about what the technology can guarantee but does not on conversely try to guarantee things that it cannot um, provide um, so it's really about honesty it's about honest technology it's about technology that is good enough to give you the guarantees that you need and is honest about when it cannot give you the guarantees that maybe we would hope you don't strictly need. And the honesty you're referring to in this regard, it's not blind trust from us common, common people. It's basically because all of the code is made public and constantly updated in the clear. But then you still need some, some degree of technological... Uh, like. You need some, some level of technological understanding or literacy, as you say in English. It's it's yeah. It works on two um, two elements, and these are com these are exactly corresponding to the two um, uh, points of decentralization. So the first one is is authoring, right? The software itself should not have flaws that allow third parties to compromise it. And yes, indeed, um, part of this is having it written by multiple people. Part of it is having multiple um, instances of instances of of it be written by separate teams. Um, and and uh, the rest of it is the fact that it's open source, right? The, the fact that anybody can come along and actually check that it does what they want it to do. Now, yeah, okay, sure, awesome. there'll be, there will be many people that do not have the technical ability to go through a large code base and check that it does what they expect it to do. But unlike law, code is pretty easy to find someone that can understand it it's easy if you're well if you're so minded to teach yourself coding many people learn javascript it really doesn't take that much um, now these systems are complex and it would be um, unreasonable to to say literally anybody could do it but realistically uh, everyone in the world likely has someone in their friendship circle that they could um, uh, reasonably trust to go into the code and at least have a bit of a check or at least know someone that that has has um, uh, has that ability and um this is simply not the case with what we have at the moment with web 2 right there is no way i can look at facebook's code and see that it and, and give it a check there is, i can't even hire someone to look at facebook's code and give it a check right doesn't exist impossible now, the other point of decentralization is operational decentralization, right? Now, this, this comes down to allowing low barriers to entry. So anybody can run, for example, if we call them Polkadot, call them validator nodes. These are nodes that run the network. They, they advance the network. They process transactions. And they check all of the other nodes are processing transactions correctly. Now, anybody, it's important that anybody can run one of these validator nodes, right? Anybody can go through the entirety of the transaction history and check every single transaction. And they can do it on standard hardware. They don't need expensive custom hardware to do that. They don't need to um, get someone's permission to find the history of all the transactions and check them. No, they can do it themselves on their own computer um, with, without uh, asking any permission. Um, to uh, to see this this history this data, and um, and that's another crucial element of Web three is this operational transparency and decentralization. And again, you cannot do that with Web two style protocols like Facebook, like WhatsApp, like Twitter. Right? You can't get operational transparency. You can't go to Twitter's offices and run your own node and check that Twitter did its did it stuff. You can't go to Facebook's offices and check that everyone who sent you a message, that their message was actually relayed to you. You can't do that. Facebook won't let you, right? But this um, is such so a you, deep, you, oh, sorry. I mean, I mean, this is such a deep shift of how one views the world. Like these are very, very, very deep myths of our society. I mean, it's, a, it's you know, everybody has their secret recipe that they do not share with anyone. Like, have Coca-Cola even made their recipes public? I mean, it's such a common concept of, of reality to have these core parts of privacy 
that is the value that you provide to the people. But I think what makes Web3 so difficult to understand or the concept of it for most people is that it's a very deep shift of how we live our lives in relation to each other and how we interact with the services that we have around us. Because it has, then it's us becoming co-creators of everything that we are using on a day-to-day -day basis in the digital realm to some extent, which is, or am I getting it wrong? It's, it's right, no? Partly, uh, but what, there is a bit of a miss, a miss, um, a miscomprehension here. Privacy is what we do not have with Web2. Now, you, you, so privacy you, you, of course, will be thinking, well, hold on. Um, Coca-Cola's recipe is secret. Therefore, it's privacy. Well, no, that's privacy. That's, that's Coca-Cola keeping a particular thing to itself, right? Now, this is, this is, that's secrecy, right? That's saying, I have a piece of information and I will not share it. Now, you can always do that. That's not an issue, right? That's in Web 2. That's in Web 3. That's in, that's in throughout history. But that, that's separate to interaction, right? If we want to interact and we want to do so in a, in a, with communication, then we do not have the option of keeping things secret, or at least we apparently don't have the option of keeping things, things secret. If I have a message, then in order to communicate that message to you, I, I actually, I have to share it. I can't, can't keep, keep it, it secret. secret. I, I can't, can't just keep it to myself, right? In the same way that Coca-Cola keeps its recipe to itself and it does not share it under any, under any circumstances. Um, if I want to communicate that recipe to you, then I have to actually somehow get it to you. So it cannot be secret. I can't keep it secret. Um, so then the question is, well, how do I communicate it? But I do so with privacy. And what this means is, in my mind, it's I'm sharing it, but I'm, I, I'm only sharing it with a limited set of people. Basically, just you. Right. I want to communicate a message to you. I want to share it with just you. So it's no longer secret because someone else knows it, not just me. Um, but it's private. It's private between us. Now, if I use Facebook to send a message, it's not private between us. Right. It's private between us, Facebook, the Facebook employees, system administrators, and whoever has hacked into Facebook systems, and the government that Facebook operates under, or governments, and their security services, and any security services, services of any, any other, other government that they work with, with and, and anyone, anyone who hacks into, into their, their systems, systems and, and anyone, anyone they, they share it with, with and, and so, so on and, and so, so forth. Basically, it's not private at all, right? It's, it's, it goes to a huge amount of other people, not just us. Um, now, what Web3 says is, Okay, you've got your secrets, fine. Now, if you want to set up a private communication, private conversation with somebody, then actually we want to give you the tools so that there aren't any third parties involved, so that Facebook can't see it, right? So that Facebook employees that want to, that want to I don't know, track you and, and, and I don't know, for whatever reason, listen in. And you think, oh, well, this is crazy. No one want to do that. This has actually happened, right? There are, there are, there are various uh, instances in the news of this happening. happening. And if you're a, you know, if you're a politician, if you're a, a, a high-ranking high um, uh, executive, this is. If, if you're a, um, if you're a uh, an activist, this happens all the time, right? Um, there are companies out there. Note, I think. Um, uh, I can't remember. Um, uh, doesn't the, the name's gone? But there are companies out there. One was in the news quite recently, providing services so that you can track activists, so that you can the track um, political opponent, Pegasus, precisely, mm -hmm. um, so that you can track uh, these various uh, uh, individuals, individuals and organizations, organizations that you want to um, keep tabs on. Right now, the point with Web three is to give those guarantees so that companies like Pegasus either can't exist or that it's much, much more expensive for them to do what it is that they uh, are trying to do. And not that I particularly like the idea that, you know, some elements of the world with enough money can spy where others can't. But the reality is that money buys services, money buys brute force power. If you have enough money, you can, in principle, um, crack someone's uh, secret key. You can crap, crack certain elements of cryptography. It's just the reality of the world. Um, but what we need to do is raise that bar as high as possible or agree that it should be at, set at zero and everybody can read everything within a particular um, set of communications. Like in Sweden. 
<laughs> like in Sweden, where everyone agrees, hey, actually, all of my personal information should be able to be read by the whole world. That, look, if, if that's what you as a, as, a, as a society agree, fine. And Bitcoin does the same thing, right? Bitcoin says, right, well, look, the world can read everybody's transaction history. Fine, whatever. It, 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 it does it. Zcash, separately, separate to, to Bitcoin, says quite the opposite. It says, right, nobody should be able to read any transaction history. It should all be um, uh, super encrypted. Whatever way you go, it's fine. But those guarantees should be clear. And you shouldn't be making, like, your technology should not be making guarantees about things that it cannot guarantee. Fair enough. So I want to bring it back a bit to, to have you define like really redefine, boil it down, what, what is Web3? Like give me an elevator, an elevator version. All right, so Web3 is a few sort of elevator versions. One of them is um, less trust, more truth. So this is basically going down to saying, um, okay, well, practical systems cannot work um, without some degree of trust, but we want to reduce it as much as possible and increase the amount of truth, increase the amount of, of the world that we know or that, machines that are acting on our behalf and no one else's no right so we're no longer trusting service providers we're increasingly doing the service ourselves for ourselves okay so that's one element another element is services without the service providers or services without servers right now this is the think about this a bit how can you have a service without a server well the idea is that there are peer-to-peer -peer, there are nodes right and you the nodes you don't trust the nodes in the same way you trust the service provider, in the same way you trust Facebook, right, to tell you what's going on. The nodes sort of each collaborate with each other without trusting each other in order to figure out what's going on and advance the network, sort of get things going. A little bit like kind of, um, a little bit like how human society works, right? We don't, um, it, it, human society in a village. Um, not human society now. So human society in a village, um, you don't, um, you know, you don't, you don't, you trust each other a little bit, but not much more than a little bit. So it's like, yeah, sure, I'll lend you a fiver, fine. You see if the person pays you back. If they don't pay you back, well, that wasn't so good. You trusted them a little bit. You only lost a fiver, so it's not a big deal. There's only a hundred people in the village. At most, taking this kind of strategy, you're only going to lose five hundred pounds. And realistically, most people will be trustworthy, and so you can expect to get most of that back. Uh, but it will be a good way of, of of finding which elements you cannot trust. And these kinds of strategies that they use a little bit of trust, but they aim to find a lot of truth are uh, ways that we can work out how to have services without individual servers, without having to go to these service providers. So that's two. Did you say you had three different elevator pitches? One is less trust, uh, less trust more truth. Yeah. Services without service. If you had to draw a third one out. Uh, I don't know. I think I might have overstretched myself with three. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to push you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> well, I, think, I think the elevator stopped now. So so. Yeah, I, think, right. I think we're good for the elevator. Do we, we get out or is it stopped? Yeah. Like really stopped? I mean, I don't know. I don't know who's getting out. Maybe I need to go to the, the top floor. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So that's the elevator pitch of Web3. And yeah. I wanted to talk as well a little bit about um, because hmm, like every ecology, let's call it, like every large complex human network needs some sort of governance system. Our current ones, I mean, we have several in place. We have the nation states and then we have our different um, monopole website uh, servers facebook google amazon all of these but they're all governed in different ways and i know that you are working with different types of governance and different types of how to upgrade democracy to some degree with your projects like in Polkadot and kusama can you talk a little bit about how you are working with these new governance methods for the new pro for the new systems for this new era yeah um briefly so when you uh, or long so when, when, uh, huh briefly or long however you prefer <laughs> all right um uh, 
So governance is um, ultimately comes down to a, it's a process, right? There are rules associated with the process. Um, if we if we look at nation states governance, um, the rules are um, you know pretty sophisticated. I mean, not that sophisticated, but pretty sophisticated. Um, you know, you have uh, uh, elections. You generally vote for a representative. Um, potentially, you vote for a representative party, and they then put the representative in place. Um, the representatives themselves vote on on things. There are uh, rules in place for deciding what what they vote on there are rules in place in case they need to leave office there are rules and sometimes rules in place to remove them from office um, there are rules in place for how often you change the delegation um, this has been um, developing over a very long time and i mean that's right there's the governance systems that you are developing they're not going to be complete or like they are not completely separate from the development of from the history of democracy, history of governance, they're just a reinterpretation in some degree, no? Sure. Um, I mean, more or less. But the the the, the key point is that um, that governance is um, a set of rules for deciding uh, uh, how to do things that were not originally um, did not originally uh, uh, sort of exist in the system so what what i mean by this is that governance if we if we think of a system we think of the, na the nation state the nation state has um has sort of processes right if, if you want to get paid um if you want to pay your taxes there is a process for paying your taxes if you want to collect a pension there is a process for collecting your pension um and you know these the rules surrounding pensions and taxes are well understood or at least they're written down and they should be in principle and ambiguous right um so they're well understood they they, they operate um and and uh, and and in principle they can op operate in perpetuity no new laws need to be passed for the pension system and the tax system to keep running in principle um Separately, if we look at like um, when we want to alter, so something maybe happens in society, new technology comes along, there are so broad social changes. Um, look at, for example, uh, the shift in, uh, in in attitude, in moral attitudes towards sexuality over the last 100, 150 years. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, homosexuality in the UK used to be a uh, problem, <laughs> used to be against the law. Um, then it sort of was repealed. Uh, and then now they're like issuing, um, it's beyond repeal, they're issuing um, uh, um, uh, uh, pardons to people that were, um, that have convictions uh, under those old uh, outdated repealed laws. Um, so there are external factors, moral attitudes, technology, ecology, the environment. These um, often require uh, unexpected changes to be made to the system, to governance. Uh, to, it's to known as like a does. level one shift. Then there's deeper shifts, you know, like from humanities, from the in the axial era or the Renaissance, and all of these. So these these shifts require, of, well, at least politicians would like to think, require new laws to be made, and it's these lawmakers who are charged with creating the new laws. Um. So what, what I call governance is this decision-making capacity of a system to change itself, right? To evolve. So just like the nation state evolves, it evolves new laws over time, um, as it's that the environmental factors, the externalities that it finds itself in um, are changed. Um, the same is needed for digital systems. Now in the old day, in, in the web two, days, the old days, <laughs> um, for me, maybe, uh, the old days, these, uh, these systems, the governance of these systems are very simple, right? The governance is, uh, if Mark Zuckerberg decides it should be so, then it is so. Easy. Very, very simple form of governance. Dictatorship, right? We would hope benevolent dictatorship. Um, and in some cases, yeah, maybe it is, but um, not, not always. Um, and not generally forever, right? Mugabe was a benevolent dictatorship for a while, um, but didn't end that way. Um, 
And so we move, we have to think about systems that um, are better, are more stable in the medium term and um, can last the long term. And so, yes, democracy or democratic systems, not really democracy. If you look like, most, like, I don't think any national voting system in the world that exists currently is actually a democracy right it's it's all very watered down democracy where you know you can choose an opposition basically you can choose an opponent or if you're in one of the sort of more democratic systems you can choose one of five opponents um but it's not uh you know we're, we're nowhere close to an actual democracy where um, individuals like more or less vote on everything and that's the hell that's what i would call the sort of um ideal version of the hellenic democracy of these these greek city states where you know every citizen i mean more or less um had a vote now um, um so what we um what we're kind of working with in these digital nation states these digital systems um, and this is separate to how things uh, started out, I would add. Um, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they don't do governance, right? These systems are not built to evolve. They're not built to be representative. Um, they are built to uh, um, essentially uh, be static, be stable, but also stagnate, right? They're all, these all have... Um, pretty similar cognates, right? Um, stay the same, be still, um, stand. <laughs> um, and they, this is not something that I think is, uh, is great for the long term. For the long term, I think we need to introduce um, a clear, um, well-respected, uh, uh, well transparent um, and uh, um, well-enforced processes to determine how these decisions, um, these, these unexpected out of band decisions that we can't predict in the, in the core protocol, how they um, should be made. Now, if you, I think if you talk to most people in, in these digital ecosystems, um, they will say, yes, uh, we should have um, processes and rules in place for making the decisions that cannot be put into the core protocol that, that aren't you know that, these these decisions that were unexpected at the time that the protocol was devised and that we you know will will have to um, uh, uh, manage um, uh, uh, as time goes on um, due to changing environmental factors whether it's you know new matters has been invented new technology has come along whatever uh, social shifts, moral shifts, doesn't really matter. But these changes come along. There should be, I think most people will say, there should be processes and rules in place. It shouldn't be a dictatorship. It shouldn't be arbitrary. It shouldn't be opaque. Um, it should be transparent, clear, uh, well-defined, uh, well-executed, enforced, da 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 Now, it turns out that we have this really good way of uh, enforcing rules right called computers and we have a really good way of enforcing rules um globally um it's called the blockchain so really what what the, my, my working governance is 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 taking these rules these rule sets that we use to make decisions and just transforming it into the blockchain environment um now the actual sets of rules to determine how these decisions are made, that's the that's that's pretty hard, right? We many social political philosophers have been working over the centuries to try and work out good ways of making decisions for human systems, um, and uh, you know we haven't really landed on any one that's particularly great. Um, we've are just got any, a lot that have trade-offs. <laughs> are there any core? essential like are there any essentials in the governance systems that you are building any core values in this regard yes um they should serve the stakeholders of the system so in um, our terms like in in the world's current terms these are the the citizens let's say yeah 
uh, they should um, bring success to the system, which in many respects is the same thing as serving the stakeholders. So we can think economically speaking, it's more or less the same as serving the stakeholders. Um, and it should be stable. Stability is also important. So it shouldn't um, risk uh, the uh, health and wealth of the system simply in order to um, uh, increase the success of the system um, if that risk is substantial. It should, uh, the system should be stable, but should generally speaking be on a, an upward long-term trajectory. So it should, we want a successful, albeit stable system. And uh, you know, these are pretty high level goals, right? But they, they at least guide our solutions for governance. So a, a classic utopian city project in, to some degree, but actually backed up by technology that provide a base for these decision making processes and elections. Yeah, what I would say, though, uh, um, is there is one like high level goal which is not present and it's typically present It's typically assumed that it should be present um, and that's representation. Representation is not a high level goal. I would argue that some degree of representation helps with um, serving stakeholders and being uh, successful um, and potentially even being stable. But in and of itself, it's not a goal. So the goal of representation is more to like to put forward a relevant question and a relevant issue, but it is not necessarily there for for the sake of being there. It's not yeah. foreign policy feminism where you basically just put women in place for the sake of it. Correct. It should be, it should be um, it's a tool, a tool to facilitate stability and a tool to facilitate and maximize success. But it should be used as much as it can be for those goals, but no more. Because I mean, this is the phase we're in. So like, there's a lot of political experimentation going on all around the world in, in many different systems, including digital and nation states and local and every, very, very everywhere. But this is mainly because of in representation, to me at least, is one of these experiment, experiments that is happening. Like what happens if we force representations? What happens if we do the quota? Like the, do our political systems actually turn out to be better? And to me, this is a separate, like a separate experimentation hub. And blockchain is another experimentation hub where you are more experimenting with the actual like infrastructure of elections like how do you ensure how do you incentivize people to vote uh, what are you voting for how many people how do you count the votes all of this so there's either and this i think is exciting in like in the blockchain space that you are actually working with voting systems and experimenting with voting systems in real time because to experiment with a voting system in real time otherwise historically has been basically to create a revolution in the country and build a new system which is really hard and, uh, that's uh, very hard very expensive very, very costly, costly and, and very unlikely um to work <laughs> as we have seen but this is actually a playing field for this type of political experimentation so right. like, there are a lot of people interested in in the implementation or in the implications of these political systems because it is the only real alternative that has been rising up in a very long time and it is many people say a part of the big shift that we're going through the big societal transformation so that's also why there are so many questions that to you as technologists are to some degree irrelevant for the work that you are doing but this is like the world's flies flocking around the only light in the dark if we're going to be very uh, very dramatic i mean there are other lights but there's there's a there's a shining one for now for sure and web3 and and crypto and blockchain are these ones
So that's why there are so many questions and so many social scientists and philosophers and writers are incredibly interested in the societal, socioeconomic implications of it. And unfortunately, I mean, it's fun to experiment, but unfortunately you also have to take these questions into consideration. And in this, like in this way, I think representation could be beneficial and something that is lacking a lot in technological communities. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Um, one more thing. So what we are seeing now, because you coined the term already seven years ago, which is quite a long time, especially- in Eight years ago now. Oh yeah, happy 2022. Eight years ago, <laughs> which is a long time ago. Um, and, and to you, I mean, the way that you are talking about it, you're obviously very deeply involved and can talk about it on a complex level, but for the most, the, maj I mean, the vast majority of the people on the planet, this is not the case. So as the world is trying to figure out how a decentralized system would, what is that? Is that anarchy? You know, like this is the level. You have been working along at a lot of different uh, projects. So what is it? Uh, so is there anything in particular that you are working on now that we will see the fruits of in say eight years time? Like what is in the, the parity lab uh, at the moment? The Polkadot Kusama parity lab at the moment? Um, there's, a, there's a lot. Um, we, we enjoy trying new things. Uh, we are builders at heart and um, we have a lot of ideas. Um, I think the one of the big things that that uh, we'll likely see in the not too distant future is um, this uh, a new governance system that I'm I'm personally working on, um, and this is designed to um, to be fairly general, so potentially could help um, uh, uh, human organisations. Um, manage their own um, governance relatively easily. Um, obviously, Polkadot is my main project, and this is um, something that you know, Parity will continue working on and uh, evolving and uh, adding to, um, of which governance is, is one avenue. There are many others. Uh, but most of them are, are pretty sort of hardcore technical. They're not... Um, especially relevant outside of the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, so, uh, but a couple of other things, like maybe uh, one of the one of the sort of uh, early stage ideas is a certification. So really trying to create um, something very, um, um, something to help the world express its opinions. Um, because ultimately that's all authority. If you take away uh, strength of arms, then that's all authority and authorization and credentials and authentication and certification is. It's an opinion. It's someone or some organization that uh, uh, states an opinion about someone or some other organization. And um, and thinking about how to do this um, uh, in such a way that everyone can benefit is, I think, uh, uh, quite an interesting proposition. So some some way that really is ultra general. Um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, there, there are lots of ultra general. Uh, how do you mean ultra general? Can you stay a bit here? Um, effectively, a, a, a way that ensures that i mean we have lots of lots of things that are you know authentic certified guaranteed like the, this a lot of different um instances of really wanting to make a statement about someone or something else whether it's I'm a person and this other person is my friend or I'm a comp I'm a government and this person is a is a citizen or 
I'm a uh, I'm Louis Vuitton, and this is one of my handbags. Or I'm a university, and this person graduated with this degree at this year, and these um, uh, grades. Or I'm a pharmaceutical company, and this is a legitimate medicine. There are so many of these pieces of certification that are important and that are all done in different ways with varying uh, capacities for um, corruption. And it would be really nice if we could collect them all together and make a technology that allowed them all to exist and interoperate. Like a, just a better certification process, like a better certification protocol, like a legitimate Rainforest Alliance certificate where you can guarantee that the farmer hasn't been bribed off by some, some dude. Or the middleman or one of the employees or the administrator of the computer system or any one of a number of other uh, corruptible forces. And it could not even be a malicious force. It could be like the you know, a government or, a, or um, an accident, an error. Um, it's, it's, yeah, there are lots of corrupting forces in the world. And um, it would be really great if we could have a cheap, ubiquitous um, way of certifying, of giving an opinion and have it be recorded and easily accessible. It's uh, some proper political power in, in building that uh, code. Uh, build it and they will come. Okay, good, beautiful. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Because it's getting a bit late. Uh, I think I think we had a, a good chat, so I'm, I'm yeah. happy to pin it here. <laughs>